Okay, so Ina. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wish it was uh, physical and not virtual. Um, so I'll be talking today about the jacobson of lemma for Lisa algebras and uh, some simplification. This is a very recent uh, joint project with uh, Vera Serganova from UC Berkeley. And I will start by, uh, I will start from the very beginning, so no uh, previous knowledge of these super algebras is assumed. Uh, please pre feel free to ask questions during, uh, during all, the, uh, all the talk. So uh, let's uh, first, uh, rem uh, let me first remind what is the Jacobson Morozov lemma in the classical setting. So we'll walk over the base field of the complex numbers. And the, uh, and the first main player will be the additive affine algebraic group, which we'll denote by GA. This, uh, this algebraic group can be embedded into the uh, algebraic group SL2 as a maximum and important subgroup, and we'll fix such an embedding. Then the jacobson morozov lemma for algebraic supergroups tells us the following. If we have an, an algebraic group L, which is reductive, and we have an embedding of the additive group GA into L, then we can extend this embedding into an embedding of SL2. And this extension is unique up to conjugation by, by an element of L. On the level of Lie algebras, this tells us that if we have a semi-simple Lie algebra and an important element in it, we can embed this important element into an SL2 triple, which is uh, the best known version, I think, of the Jacobson model. And this embedding is unique up to conjugation by an element of our reductive group. So what we want to do today is describe how can one generalize this to the super algebras? Or rather, build an analog, not quite general, for the super algebras. Okay, so in order to describe what are the super algebras, I will start with uh, what is a tensor category. So, as I said, my base field is C and all the uh, constructions I will describe will be C linear. So what is a tensor category? A tensor category is an abelian category A together with a bifunctor, which is bifunctor of tensor product. It should be bilinear. And I will require furthermore that my category be monoidal. So that means that we have a unit object. So the tensoring with it gives me the same object I started with. And I will require my category to be symmetric. So that means that I have some fixed isomorphism telling me that my tensor product is commutative. So both the property that we have a unit object and this property of, property of commutativity of a tensor product is actual data which we need to give. So in the first case, this is just an isomorphism between, uh, between one tensor A and, uh, and my object A. And in the second case, these are isomorphisms between, uh, between a tensor product A1 times A2 and the tensor product A2 times A1. So this is sort of a flip. And this symmetry is an important additional data. Now, the third thing which I require for my tensor category is that this category be rigid. So every object should have a dual, which comes together with a fixed co-evaluation map and evaluation map, satisfying some conditions. Now, what are a tensor categories good for? Well, as you can see, tensor categories are generalizations of commutative algebras. We have a notion of product, we have a unit element, we have some commutativity, 
And the fact that these categories are also rigid allow us to measure things like traces of endomorphisms. What, are tra what is a trace of an endomorphism? If f is an endomorphism from A to A, I can define its trace as a composition uh, uh, as written below, which basically means that the trace is an endomorphism of my unit object. And in all that we will discuss, the endomorphisms of unit objects are just complex numbers. So my trace is defined to be a complex number. And furthermore, this rigidity allows me to discuss dimensions of objects, in a categorical sense, where the dimension of an object A is just trace of its identity morphism. So now let me give the main examples of tensor categories which we need. So the most basic example is the category of vector spaces. In here we have the usual notion of tensor product of vector spaces. We have a unit object, which is just the one dimensional vector space. We have a symmetry uh, structure, which is just uh, the flip map, which flips uh, the order of the, um, of the factors. And rigidity tells us that for each finite dimensional vector space V, we have a dual V star with the co-evaluation and evaluation maps given uh, as follows. And of course, in this case, the notions of trace and dimension are just the usual trace of endomorphism and dimension of vector space as we study in linear algebra. So, the, so find dimensional vector spaces form a tensor category. More generally, if we take any group G, we can consider its finite dimensional representations, and this will also form a tensor category. Again, dimension is the usual dimension for representation. When uh, is this category semi-simple? Well, if we consider a fine algebraic groups G, then the category rep G is semi-simple precisely when G is reductive. So this is the setting which, uh, which is relevant for the Jacobson model of lemma. Okay, so now let's go on to the next example of a tensor category, which is actually the one most relevant to us today. These are vector superspaces. So what are vector superspaces? Vector superspaces are, are just Z to graded vector spaces. Whenever we say super, we mean Z to graded, which will denote as V uh, whose even part is V0 and odd part is V1. So all the vectors in the even part will be called even vectors and the vectors in the odd part will be called odd vectors. Finite dimensional super vector spaces form a category together with the grading preserving linear maps. And this category is a tensor category. What is the structure? So let me denote by P of V for any homogeneous vector V, the parity of this vector. We can, we have the following, um, the following structure of a tensor category on the super vector spaces. We have a unit, which is just the uh, the vector space, the one dimensional vector space, which is, um, which is purely even. Of course, it is a unit with respect to the usual tensor product. So this already tells us how to multiply, uh, how to multiply tensorially vectors, super vector spaces, and what is, uh, what is the monoid mon uh, structure. Now, the interesting thing about, about this category is how we define the symmetry. So the symmetry tells us the following. When we want to flip the order of two, uh, of two uh, factors in the tensor product, we flip 
the order of the homogeneous vectors, but we add a sign whenever both vectors are odd. So this tells us that the category of super vector spaces as a tensor category is not just a category of Z2 graded vector spaces per se. So the tensor product is, some, is the same, but the symmetry structure is new. Now, we also have the notion of dual, just like for usual vector spaces. Of course, the dual, the, the dual space of V is also Z2 graded. But now we have a new notion of categorical dimension. So the categorical dimension of a super vector space is not the usual dimension of a vector space, but rather if we compute it by the formula we gave before, it will be the difference of the dimensions of its even part and its odd part. One more uh, feature of the category of super vector spaces is the parity shift. For each super vector space V, we can uh, switch the odd and the even part of V, and this new super vector space is denoted by pi of V. So a, a typical example of a super vector space is CMN, which is a notation for a super vector space whose even part is m-dimensional and odd part is n-dimensional. In this case, the categorical dimension called super dimension for short is m minus n. So it is now a, an integer, but not necessarily non-negative, of course. So we can have a super vector space of categorical dimension minus five. Are there any questions? So the main thing to take away from this, uh, from this slide is that vector superspaces are just, uh, just like Z2 graded vector spaces, but we have a sign which appears every time we switch the order of two vectors. And in particular, this, uh, this changes the way we see, uh, we see different categorical constructions. So just like in the setting of vector spaces, we can also develop the theory of algebraic groups in this setting. They will be called algebraic supergroups. And we can define uh, Lie algebras in this setting, which are called Lie superalgebras. Similarly, you can define supercommutative superalgebras, Hopf superalgebras, et cetera, et cetera. And the only difference between these and the classical notion of uh, commutative algebras, Hopf algebras, et cetera, is the Z2 grading and the sign which, which appears uh, when you switch any two, uh, when you switch the order of any two odd elements. So what is an algebraic supergroup? Well, we have two equivalent definitions. One is using Hopf superalgebras. So to every Hopf superalgebra, we can uh, we can define the corresponding of an algebraic supergroup as its spectrum in the sense that the category of a final algebraic supergroups is the opposite category to the category of Hopf superalgebras. Of course, to every supergroup G will uh, say that the corresponding Hopf superalgebra is just the superalgebra of functions on G, but we don't really have the geometric object G, which we can think of as a manifold in this case. Alternatively, we can define an algebraic supergroup as a representable functor from the category of supercommutative algebras to groups. Well, this is all good, but this is pretty abstract. So let's see something more down to earth. So what is the least superalgebra? 
the bracket, any two elements that's an even element, and any two elements of opposite parities gives us an odd element. What are the axioms in this case? Well, they are very similar to the axioms of a Lie algebra, but again, we have a sign appearing. So for instance, in terms of the uh, anti-commutativity, we'll require that for any two homogeneous elements in my Lie superalgebra, the bracket of A and B is minus the bracket of B and A, but with a sign added whenever both A and B are odd. And similarly, we have a super Jacobi agent. So what can be said about the even and the odd parts of a Lie superalgebra? So the even part of the Lie superalgebra, G0, is just a Lie algebra in itself. The odd part is not a Lie algebra in itself, but the bracket on the Lie superalgebra defines us an action of the Lie algebra G0 on G1. So G1 is just a representation of G0. And of course, we have, uh, we have a bracket taking uh, G1 times G1 to G0. For every algebraic supergroup, we can define the corresponding Lie superalgebra, just as the Lie superalgebra corresponding to the Hopf algebra O of G. So this is done in precisely the same way as for, um, for algebraic groups. No difference here. So now let's uh, talk about the representations of supergroups, which is actually uh, what we are more interested in today. So we denote by rep G the category of finite dimensional algebraic representations of our supergroup G in super vector spaces. So each representation is a super vector space together with an action of our algebraic group. The action of the algebraic group also defines as an action of the corresponding Lie algebra, Lie superalgebra, sorry. And rep G is a tensor category. So this is the most general example of a tensor category, which we'll see today. Now, how can we describe the category of the category of rep G in a more down-to-earth way? Well, instead of considering a supergroup, which is, as we said, somewhat too abstract, uh, we can consider a Harris chamber pair consisting of a finite dimensional Lie superalgebra, G small and an algebraic group G0. We require that the Lie algebra of this algebraic group will be precise, is precisely the even part of our Lie superalgebra. And we also want an action of our algebraic group G0 on the odd part of the Lie superalgebra so that the differential of this section is precisely the add action coming from the bracket on the Lie superalgebra G. So any such pair defines a unique algebraic supergroup G. This is a very nice result due to Masuoka. And in this, uh, with this approach, we can describe the category of finite dimensional representations of the supergroup G, just as the category of finite dimensional modules over the Lie algebra G small, which integrate over the algebraic group G0. So this approach allows us to not deal with, uh, to not really deal with uh, algebraic supergroups, but rather just deal with Lie superalgebras and algebraic groups. So now let me give some examples. So first of all, we have the general linear supergroup, which is just the analog of the general linear group, but in the super world. We consider the super vector space CMN, and we consider the algebraic group of all the automorphisms of this space. Now, this algebraic group, this algebraic supergroup has much more uh, in, has much more elements and information than just the parity-preserving 
automorphisms of C, M, N. Instead, we also have sort of the odd part, which we do not see as proper automorphisms. How can we describe this, uh, this algebraic supergroup explicitly? Well, let's first take a look at what the least superalgebra is. The least superalgebra consists of all the endomorphisms of our super vector space C, M, N. When I say all the endomorphisms, and I write here end uh, bullet, I mean not just those which preserve uh, the, grade, the Z2 gradient, but all of them. So this space is naturally Z2 graded. We have those endomorphisms which preserve parity and those which switch parity. And so this is naturally a super vector space in itself. On this superalgebra, we define the bracket in a very, very similar to the bracket on the general linear group. So the bracket of A and B is AB minus BA with a sign added whenever A and B are odd. And the algebraic group corresponding to this, even algebraic group, will be just GLM times GLM. So this is the general linear supergroup. One can study the category of its representations. It's very interesting and uh, a lot is known about it, not everything. But uh, the first thing to note, to say about this category is that it is not semi-simple. So even though we are working over the complex numbers, the, uh, the categories of representations of al algebraic supergroups tend to be not semi-simple, even in the most fundamental cases like this one. Okay, so now let's give another example, the autosymplectic supergroup OSP. So consider the super vector space CM2N and we define a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form on V in the most, um, in the most natural way. And we, then we set OSP M to N to be the supergroup preserving this, uh, this symmetric bilinear form. Why is it called OSP? So this is autosymplectic because when we have a symmetric form on V, it behaves as a symmetric form on the vector space V0, the even part of V, while on the odd part of V, it behaves as a symplectic form. So this is why we have both an orthogonal part and a symplectic part of this supergroup. And the even part of the supergroup is just the algebraic group OM times SP2N. Uh, let me uh, stop for a minute and uh, ask whether you have any questions. Uh, sorry, so you said that the so uh, this supergroup uh, GLMN is not uh, uh, does not give a same simple representation category. And uh, so, is it correct to uh, think uh, that the real algebra has extension, so the modules also have uh, extension problems? So the category of representations of uh, of the Lie algebra, Lie superalgebra is of course also not not semi simple because it contains the representations of the group. Uh, I'm not sure whether whether this uh, this answers this, but um, yeah. So simple modules over the Lie superalgebra GLMN have non-trivial extensions. Uh, but so I mean, so for the GL uh, M, it's uh, uh, if you start building in uh, the group itself, then so you get sim same simple category, right? Yeah. If you if you if you just take. Uh, GLM and uh, GLM, you will take you will obtain a semi-simple category, but here we have much more information than just a product of uh, the two uh, the two algebraic groups GLM and GLM because we also have odd an odd part of this supergroup. Yeah, so the so the so this super algebra had something like extension of even part acting yeah. on odd part. Yeah, 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 precisely. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. 
Any more questions? Okay, then let's move on. So let me give some more examples of uh, supergroups which will be relevant for us today. So we said that we have the autosymplectic supergroup. Let us take a very specific autosymplectic supergroup, OSP12. So in this case, the uh, Lie superalgebra will have a very nice structure, namely the Lie superalgebra OSP12 has a three-dimensional even part, which is just the Lie algebra SL2, and the two-dimensional odd part with the action of the even part on the odd part just being the action of SL2 on its uh, defining two-dimensional presentation. So the harris chandler pair corresponding to this supergroup is just this Lie superalgebra OSP12 together with the algebraic group SL2. In this case, the category of representations of this supergroup is semi-simple, which is very nice and very rare, as we'll see in a moment. And we can describe explicitly who are the simple modules in this category. So I will uh, call them m bar 2k and its parity shift pi m bar 2k. Of course, whenever we have a simple module, its parity shift is also uh, simple. And what do these simple modules look like? Well, the simple module m bar 2k will have a k plus one dimensional even part, a k dimensional odd part. So its super dimension will be the difference, which is one. And if we restrict the action of our Lie super algebra just to the Lie algebra SL2, what we see is that the Lie algebra SL2 acts separately on the even and odd part. And each of these parts becomes just an irreducible representation of SL2. So here we have a picture of what uh, the module M6 looks like. As you can see, we have the uh, white dots which stand for even vectors and the black dots which stand for odd vectors. The elements X and Y are odd elements in my Lie superalgebra and they go between the even and the odd vectors. The Lie algebra SL2 will act separately on the white dots and separately on the black dots. So this was always P12. And now a completely different supergroup, which I will call the additive supergroup. The additive supergroup, which I denote by GA11, is given by the following Hirsch Chandra pair. We have a Lie superalgebra, which is one one dimensional nilpotent Lie superalgebra. So this means that it has an odd part, which is one dimensional, this is spanned by an odd element X and an even part, which is also one dimensional, spanned by the bracket of X with itself. Here I should say that uh, why is the bracket of X with itself not zero, as it usually is in Lie algebras? Well, because of the sign rules, which we mentioned when we defined Lie superalgebras, the bracket of, uh, of an odd element of itself does not have to be zero. Okay, so this Lie superalgebra has a one-dimensional even part, which is just the uh, one-dimensional additive Lie algebra, which is commutative. And the other element in my house chandra pair, the actual algebraic group, will be just the additive algebraic group as we know. So what is so nice about this uh, additive supergroup? Well, for one thing, we can embed it into the, um, into the supergroup OSP12 with uh, the corresponding Lie superalgebras embedding as a maximum important subalgebra. So you can say that 
the additive supergroup is a maximal unipotent subgroup of OSP12. And you can already see that we are starting to mimic the setting of, um, of the jacobson morozov theorem, where the additive supergroup replaces the additive algebraic group, and OSP12 replaces SL2. So what about the representations of my odd supergroup? Well, the category of representations is not semi-simple, just like it is for the additive uh, algebraic group. But we can describe all the decomposable objects in this category, which is very nice. This is very rare. So what are the decomposables? The decomposables come in pairs, just as before, for which in the composable we have its parity shift. And I will number them by non-negative integers. So the dimension of the indecomposable module MK is K plus one, with the super dimension being one of zero. And the module MK can be just given by a span of a chain of elements, each of which is obtained from the previous one by applying my odd element X from the super algebra. So here is a picture of M6. As you can see, the number of even vectors, which are denoted by white, uh, white circles, is the same as the number of uh, odd elements, which are denoted by black circles. And so in this case, the super dimension will be just, uh, will be, so you know, uh, I'm wrong. Here there are four white circles and three black circles, so the super dimension is one. These are the examples of supergroups. And I will say a bit more about the connection of the additive supergroup and OSP12 soon enough. So now, what about the semi-simplicity of rep G? We said that this is very rare. In fact, we have the following theorem. If we have a connected algebraic supergroup G, so that the category of its representations is semi-simple, then this supergroup can be shown to be a product of a reductive algebraic group and several autosymplectic supergroups of the form OSP1 to N. So of course, these supergroups are, uh, are very rare, and it is interesting to understand what is a more general uh, framework which will replace the notion of a reductive algebraic group, and which will cover many examples of uh, supergroups. So instead, we'll have the following notion due to Verasel Vandeberg. A supergroup G will be called quasi-reductive if it corresponds to a harish chandra pair with a Lie superalgebra and an algebraic group G0, and G0 is reductive. So such a quasi-reductive supergroup is particularly nice because the category of its representations, although it is not semi-simple, it has enough projectives, which makes it much, much easier to work with. And this notion is actually uh, inclusive enough because most of the well-known supergroups such as GLMN, the autosymplectic supergroup, and uh, the special linear supergroup, which I haven't defined, but which is defined similarly to the special linear group, are quasi-reductive, as well as the uh, strange superalgebras P and Q, for those who heard of them. So uh, quasi-reductive is the new reductive. So now let me go uh, back to the jacobson morozov lemma and show you what, who are the new players. So instead of the additive group GA, we'll have the additive supergroup GA11, which we already saw. The Lie algebra of the additive group is one dimensional and it will be replaced by one one dimensional Lie algebra of the additive supergroup. The even part of my new Lie superalgebra is just GA, 
and the roles played by the additive group and the additive supergroup are very similar. Namely, if I have an important element f in a Lie algebra, this corresponds to a homomorphism from my additive group GA to the algebraic group G corresponding to this Lie algebra. In the super world, if I start with an odd nilpotent element in a Lie superalgebra, this corresponds to a group homomorphism from the additive supergroup to my supergroup G corresponding to the Lie superalgebra G lowercase. So what replaces the algebraic group SL2? Well, it is replaced by the algebraic supergroup OSP12. And we said that the even algebraic group uh, for OSP12 is precisely SLP, which is also what we see on the level of Lie algebras. The Lie algebra SL2 is replaced by the Lie algebra OSP12, whose even part is SL2. And again, just like GA was a maximal unipotent subgroup of SL2, the additive supergroup is a maximal unipotent subgroup of OSP12. And reductive groups in the setting in this setting will be replaced by quasi-reductive supergroups. Okay, so now we are ready to state the Jacobson morose of lemma for supergroups. So we will need one definition. Namely, the Jacobson morose of lemma will not be stated for all uh, nilpotent or nilpotent elements in my Lie superalgebra, but instead only for elements which will be called neat. So who are neat elements? If we have an important odd operator X on a super vector space V, so here I write and V1, meaning that X is not a parity preserving operator, but rather it switches the parity. Such an important element operator is called neat if when we consider the corresponding action of our additive supergroup GA11 on the super vector space V, all the indecomposable summons of V will have non-zero superdimension. So they should all be of the form M to K. So now what does the jacobson morozov lemma, uh, which we proved, uh, say? If we take a quasi-reductive supergroup G and we take a non-zero odd nilpotent element in the corresponding Lie algebra, so that this odd element X acts neatly on any representation V of G, then we have a corresponding embedding of the additive supergroup GA11 into my quasi-reductive supergroup G. And this embedding can be extended to a homomorphism, or in fact, to an embedding from the supergroup OSP12 into the supergroup G, which is unique up to conjugation. So as you see, this is a very, very uh, good analog of the classical, uh, of the classical jacobson morozov lemma, with the only caveat being the neatness, which we now require. So I will say a few more words about the neatness and why it is a necessary and sufficient condition. But uh, before that, I just want to say that although we say that we require the element X to act neatly on any representation V of G, in, we can actually require something much, much uh, more uh, convenient or to be more precise, something which is easier to check. Namely, it is enough to require that X acts neatly on some faithful representation of G. 
If it acts neatly on some faithful representation of G, then it acts neatly on all the representations. So this is the theorem. Now let me give an example. So consider the supergroup GL12. We take a look at the Lie algebra of GL12, and we can just write this Lie, the elements in this Lie superalgebra as block matrices. In this case, we have a very, very explicit description of who the neat elements are. As you can see, these are odd elements. And uh, for a given neat element x, as written here, we can write out explicitly what will be the subalgebra O is P12, which we obtain from the Jacobson or the plan. So what would this, will this uh, subalgebra look like? The element, the odd element x in this subalgebra will be just the x which we wrote here. The odd element y will be as written downstairs. And OSP12 will be, the subalgebra OSP12 will be generated by x and y as a Lie superalgebra. So if we want to write it explicitly, here is the matrix form of the elements in this subalgebra. As you can see, A and B correspond to odd elements in this subalgebra and E, C and D correspond to even elements in this subalgebra where the even, the even elements have the form E, C, D minus E, meaning that they are precisely matrices in the Lie algebra SL2. Yes, traceless two by two matrices. So this is, uh, this is an example of an embedding of OSP12, as we can see it from the Jacobson model. So let me say a few words about neatness and about the proof. So why do we require neatness? So we call that the reducible representations of OSP12 were denoted by M bar 2K. And then the composable representations of the additive supergroup were denoted by MK. And the parity shifts, of course. The super dimension of MK was zero whenever K was odd. So we said that the, uh, the additive supergroup embeds into OSP12. Then we can look at the restriction from OSP12 to its subgroup GA11. How does this restriction work? Well, it takes the reducible representation M to K, which explains the notation. So now let's consider the setting of our Jacobson Morozov lemma. We have a quasi reductive supergroup. We have a non-zero ordinal potent element in our Lie superalgebra. And we assume for a moment that we already have a, an embedding of my additive supergroup GA in one one into G, which factors through the embedding of GA11 into OSP12. In that case, if we take any representation V of my supergroup G, we can restrict it first to OSP12 and then to GA11. We want to explain that when we restrict it to GA11, to my additive supergroup, all the summons will be of the form M to K. So they will all have non-zero super dimension. How can we see that? Well, we first restrict to OSP12. In that case, we'll have irreducible summons of the form M bar to K and their parity shifts. And of course, once we restrict again to GA11, 
to the additive supergroup, the only in the composable summons we can get are of the form M to K and their parity sheets. So this tells us that if we want our embedding of GA11 into the supergroup G to factor through OSP12, our element X necessarily has to act neatly on all the representations of G. So this is why neatness is actually a necessary condition. So now a few words about the proof. So the key tool in proving this theorem is the notion of semi-simplification. So let me go back to tensor categories. What is a semi-simplification of a tensor category? So this is a, um, an analog of the notion of semi-simplification of an algebra. Namely, if we have a tensor category A, the semi-simplification is the universal pair consisting of a semi-simple tensor category A bar and a functor S from A to A bar, which preserves tensor products and is full. Full meaning that it is surjective on morphisms. How can we construct explicitly this semi-simplification? Well, it is natural to try and construct something which is similar to the uh, semi-simplification of algebras, namely, we want to take our tensor category A and quotient it by some ideal. But in this case, the ideal will be an ideal of morphisms. So this is just a, a set of morphisms, which are what we call negligible morphisms. So who are those? Those are morphisms in my category, which when paired with a morphism in the other direction, so if we take a morphism F from A1 to A2, and we compose it with a morphism G from A2 to A1, any G, then the trace of the composition is necessarily zero. Such morphisms F are called negligible, and they form an ideal under composition and tensor product. So what does this mean? It means that when we take our category A and we quotient by this ideal of negligible morphisms, meaning that now we require that in the new category, the objects will be the same, but the morphisms which were negligible are now zero. What we obtain is a semi-simple tensor category. And the quotient functor preserves tensor products and is full because it's a quotient. So this gives us an explicit construction of the semi-simplification of A. And the first fun example is when we take our category A to be the category of representations of the additive algebraic group GA. In this case, it, this is a pretty classical fact, I think due to Andre Kahn and Sullivan, or, or Sullivan uh, the semi-simplification of A is just the category of representations of the algebraic group SL2. And the quotient functor is somewhat tricky. It goes from the category of representations of GA to the category of representations of SL2. It is not exact, but when we compose it with the natural restriction functor, we get the identity functor on rep SL2. So this is sort of a uh, complement in a sense to uh, the restriction functor not adjoint. So how do we use this semi-simplification? Well, we build an analog of this example in the super world. Namely, we have the following situation. If we take the category of representations of the, of the additive supergroup, GA11, the semi-simplification will be the category of representations of OSP12. And again, the quotient functor S will be not just a full uh, functor preserving tensor products, but when we compose it with the restriction functor, it will give us identity. 
And furthermore, we can say explicitly what does it do to indecomposable objects in, uh, in rep GA11. Well, if we take an indecomposable object MK, then it is sent to a simple OSP12 representation MK whenever K is even, and otherwise it is sent to zero. And this uh, functor S is, as we said, C linear, so it preserves direct products. So this, uh, this proposition actually tells us all the information we need on how this functor S works. So now, how do we use this to prove the theorem, the actual theorem? Well, let's take a neat and important odd element in our Lie superalgebra G and the corresponding embedding Ix of the additive supergroup into G. Then we have a restriction functor Rx from rep G to the category of representations of my additive supergroup. If we compose it with the semi-simplification functor S, we obtain a functor from rep G to rep OSP12. And we want to explain that this, actually, this is actually a restriction functor with respect to some embedding of OSP12 into G. Well, how do we do that? We want to explain that S composed with Rx is exact. And for this, we use the fact that X was neat. Namely, because X is neat for all, ver for all representations of G, X acts neatly on them, the functor S composed with Rx is faithful. It does not make V any smaller when applied to it. Of course, if we apply just the restriction functor Rx, it does not make the super space V any smaller, but the functor S could potentially kill off some of its indecomposable parts. But the fact that X, X acts neatly tells us that this will not happen. Now, a trickier part is explaining why S composed with Rx does not annihilate any morphisms, but this is something which can also be done. And from here, we conclude that S composed with Rx is actually exact. This is not completely trivial, but not very, uh, not very complicated either. And now, if we have an exact functor from rep G to rep OSP12, the uh, Tanakian formalism tells us that this corresponds to a homomorphism of algebraic supergroups. And this homomorphism is precisely the embedding we are looking for. So this is, uh, this is the idea of the proof. And I think uh, I will stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.